Um, and we're really excited to kick this off with a topic that I have to tell you is near and dear to my heart, and that is public speaking. How do you make money uh, public speaking, and how can you attract clients uh, from public speaking? And I, I will tell you, in my own uh, business, 75% of the revenue that comes to my business is from my pu public speaking activities, and almost the rest of that 25% comes from other work that comes from uh, me having, having spoken to a group of people. So it's a really uh, amazing opportunity for both increasing visibility and revenue, and we're delighted to have an amazing uh, speaker speak to you about speaking, um, and that is Steve Lowell. And, and I'll just tell you a couple of interesting things about Steve. Uh, one is he was pretty much destined his whole life to become a public speaker because he was on the live stage since the age of six uh, as a musician, and he has transitioned and, and now does public speaking. He happens to be uh, among only 12%, I believe, of the world's professional speakers who hold a CSP, which is Certified uh, Professional Speaker Credential, and I know you all understand the importance of credentials. So um, he's going to share with you uh, all of his insights and everything he's learned from being on the speaking circuit so that you can think about how you use this to augment your coaching revenue and also use it as a way to attract clients. So with that, let me turn it over to the amazing Steve Lowell. Well, thanks very much, and welcome, everybody. It is such a privilege for me to be here, and uh, we're going to cover some really exciting things today. If you are even remotely interested in adding professional speaking to your platform and start generating revenue from the live stage, then you're in the right place today. Just a few administrative items uh, before we get started. Number one is I won't be using a lot of slides in the presentation today, but I will be using some. So uh, don't walk away because I want you to be here for the important slides. So uh, there will be a few, but for the most part, there will only be a few slides in our presentation. And then number two is uh, I am at the moment in Africa, and, and we although we have tested this connection, a few days ago, and we tested it earlier uh, today, just before we started. Um, the connection seems fine, but if I do lose my connection, I do have a backup plan to reconnect. So uh, if I get dumped, stay tuned, and I'll, I'll reconnect as soon as I can. And, and at the end of our presentation today, there will be a short time for Q&A, and so uh, I'm going to provide you with, uh, with also a few websites that you can go to to get some more information to really elevate your speaking skills. So that takes care of the admin part of, uh, of our program today, so why don't we go ahead and get started. You know, in, uh, in over 20 years of coaching and mentoring professional and aspiring speakers around the world, I found that so many coaches, uh, they really want to add professional speaking to their marketing mix, but they just don't know how to get started in the speaking business, and it's almost always because they don't really understand the changing landscape of the speaking business, and so we're going to talk about some of those things today, and I'm going to share with you some basic concepts uh, that you'll need to know in order to position yourself as someone who has really earned the right to take the live stage and to create demand for your services as a speaker. And we'll discuss some of the fictions of the speaking business and I'll share with you some of the current realities of how money is being made from the live stage. And it really all begins, I believe, with the biggest mistake that almost every aspiring speaker makes that literally prevents them from becoming a real professional speaker, and that's this. This is the number one mistake I see from aspiring speakers, and that is prematurely branding themselves as speakers before they're really ready to be professional speakers. And so what happens is I see a lot of coaches, and not just coaches, but entrepreneurs and authors and trainers and, and, uh, and, and healers and professionals of all different kinds, and they decide that they want to be a speaker. And then what they do is they create a website and they position themselves out there as a speaker instead of positioning themselves as an expert. And this is one area where the, uh, the landscape is changing in the speaking environment. Uh, it used to be that organizations, associations, and corporations, and event planners would look for motivational speakers for their events. Now that still happens today. You can make an amazing living as a motivational speaker and people will hire you. But that part of the speaking world is really diminishing quickly. And what's happening more and more is organizations now are looking for professionals and experts 
who happen to speak. So the biggest mistake I see is people saying, okay, you know, I want to be a professional speaker. And so they put that out there to the world and they say, hello world, I'm a professional speaker. And what happens is that that kind of pigeonholes you into the same category as all the other aspiring speakers. And it doesn't bring you any sort of prestige anymore because there's so many people doing it. And then what happens is you end up competing with everybody else out there who claims to be a speaker. And if you've been to conferences, and I know most of you have been to conferences, you'll know that just because you can get on a stage and speak in front of an audience <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean you should get on a stage. And I think some of you probably know what I mean. And so a lot of times people will end up uh, you know, promoting themselves as speakers and then when they do get some sort of a gig, they take the stage and they're really not properly prepared, either from a content perspective or from a delivery skills perspective. So we're going to talk about all of that today. So what event planners and associations and corporations are really looking for now is experts who happen to speak professionally. And so what we want to do is we want to brand ourselves and position ourselves as known experts in our field who happen to also speak. And at the same time, you want to be able to deliver. So there are some fundamental principles about speaking itself that I want to share with you before we get into the process of how you actually start making money speaking. So we need to understand some of these, per the, these basic skills. Number one is speaking is not about transferring information. And this is an important concept, especially for coaches, because as coaches, what we're really accustomed to doing is, is coaching people to develop the skill and the knowledge and the wisdom and the expertise that they have. And as coaches, I've seen it so many times when coaches and, and teachers and trainers take the stage, they sort of get confused about what the purpose is. And when you take the stage as a speaker, your function changes from that of a coach to that of somebody who is... Uh, the purpose is now to transport you, your, uh, your feeling about your topic, your passion about your topic. So keynote speaking is about transferring emotion, not transferring information. And what that means is you need to have developed some certain skill in order to do that. So that's an important part of the speaking business. And so I wanted you to know that. So the question then becomes, how do you position yourself as the known expert in your field in order to secure more paid speaking engagements. Now, before we go on, I just want to confirm that you're seeing um, my slides on here. Can somebody just sort of confirm with me that we're seeing the slides uh, verbally? Because I can't see the uh, I can't see the panel. Yes, we can see your slides, Steve. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. That's all I was looking for. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I want to share with you a tool. This could be the single most important tool that you use in your business. And some people use this tool deliberately, some people use it by accident and don't even know that they're using it, and some people uh, don't even know it exists. In fact, most people don't even know it exists because I made it up. But it's a really cool tool. So here's what this is. This is a, a, what I call a meter. And the meter measures things, right? Like the speedometer in your car measures your speed or the odometer measures the mileage or whatever. This is a meter and it measures your, the state of your reputation. And I call it your repu meter. And on the repu meter, there are four milestones that we want to shoot for as coaches and as aspiring speakers. And in fact, you can apply this to any business, but we're going to operate this in the context of speaking. So the first milestone is this. When you first start out as a speaker, and even as a coach, when you first start out, nobody really knows what you do, and nobody really knows who you are. So you are in a state of what I call obscurity. And obscurity means that you're out there doing your thing and you might be presenting yourself to the world as a speaker, you might be presenting yourself to the world as a coach, but no, nobody really knows what you do and who you are. And this is where we typically start out. And then we start getting some clients and we start generating some business and good things start happening and we move up to the next level, which I call competitive. Now, at the competitive level, this is where most people in your circle of influence, and we're going to talk about the circle of influence again shortly, most people in your circle of influence, they know who you are and they know what you do, but there's really nothing that separates you from other people who do what you do. So at the competitive stage, what that means is you're in the game, 
but you're not really standing out. Now, here's the issue with being at this level, is this is where most people get stuck, especially in the speaking world. When they try to break into the speaking world, they get stuck at this competitive stage, which means, okay, people know that you're a speaker. I mean, the people who matter. They know that you're a speaker, but there's nothing really that separates you from the hundreds and thousands of other speakers that are out there. So associations and corporations and, and meeting planners and Speakers bureaus, they get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of resumes and emails and promo packages and as everybody wants to be a speaker, so they get all kinds of these things. If you're at the competitive stage, there's nothing that separates you out. And so what we need to do is we need to move ourselves up to the next milestone, which is called the distinctive stage. Now, at the distinctive stage, you now are becoming a member of a category of a few. See, back at the competitive stage, you're in a category of many. At the distinctive stage, you're in a category of a few. So the question is, how do you get to the distinctive stage? Well, the distinctive stage uh, is a, a position where something very unique happens within your, your, your sphere of influence, within your reputation. What happens at this stage is you reach what I call a tipping point. And the tipping point is this. When you're going from obscurity to competitive and on your way up to distinctive, you are becoming known for what you do. People are starting to know you for being a certain type of coach, a coach that operates you know, with a certain type of, uh, of person. And everybody's starting to recognize you as a coach and now becoming a speaker. But at the distinctive stage, what's happening is this. You now start becoming known for the results that you achieve instead of for what you do. So now at this distinctive level, people start talking about you differently. They start talking about you no longer as a coach and no longer as a coach who speaks. You are now one of the very few coaches who speak about a specific topic or get a specific kind of result. And we're going to talk about how you get those results and so forth. And then the fourth uh, element or the fourth milestone on the repu meter, this is where we all want to be sort of striving towards, and that is breakthrough. At the breakthrough level, you are no longer within a category of many. You're no longer within a category of a few. You are now basically a category of one. So you are not a coach. You're not a coach who speaks. You are the coach who speaks. You are the coach who speaks about whatever because you are the coach who gets these kind of results. So I'll give you an example outside of the coaching world. No, I won't. You know, I'll give you an example inside the coaching world. A friend of mine here in, uh, in Ottawa, Canada, uh, her name is Peggy McCall. And Peggy is a, she is a coach who works with authors, and she helps them become bestseller authors. So if we t follow this track or, and, and use Peggy as an example, when Peggy started her business, she was in the state of obscurity. And so she was a coach, but nobody really knew what she did or, or who she was. Then she became up to the competitive level because she started working with some clients, and nobody was asking her to speak anywhere. So she got to the competitive level, and people started understanding, oh, Peggy is a coach who helps people write, write books. And then she started going out and getting some of her own speaking engagements, which you and I are going to talk about again, some speaking engagements that maybe were not paying her, but she learned how to make a little bit of money from them and, and get herself some exposure and position herself as the expert in helping people write best-selling books. So she reached the distinctive level very quickly. At the distinctive level, she reached the tipping point where people stopped seeing her as a coach who helps people write books, but they started seeing her as the coach who helps people become bestsellers, and she became known as the bestseller maker. Notice I, I said the bestseller maker, not a bestseller maker. And so at the distinctive spot, when people started speaking to her as the coach who you know helps people make write best-selling books, that's when the speaking engagements started coming in. That's when she started making money speaking. So this whole repu meter piece is very important for you to understand because if you want to break into the speaking business these days and really make money at it, you, you have to find a way to get yourself up to that distinctive level and beyond. So then the question is, how do you get to that distinctive level? There are three things that you have to have, and you, you've got to have these things. You have to have all three. If you don't have one of them, then you really struggle becoming a known speaker. But here's the first thing you need to have in order to work towards that breakthrough level. First thing is outstanding client results. 
whatever it is that you're doing, whatever it is you're working with, whatever your expertise or experience is, whoever your clients are, those clients have to be getting outstanding results. If your clients are not getting outstanding results, then you know, we can't really help you here. You, you have to get better at what you do, master your craft, go back to school, learn more, whatever it is you have to do to get better at getting those outstanding client results. And here's why. Because once you start getting outstanding client results, that naturally brings us to the second element that we need to move through this repu meter, and that is raving fans. We need to turn those clients into raving fans. And we do that through the use of social media and all those things. I know you've got some sessions on here about LinkedIn and, and other social media uh, platform so you, you need to learn how to take those clients that are experiencing these amazing results and turn them into raving fans now once you start turning them into raving fans you're going to find that you're going to be getting more and more attention from organizations who have opportunities for speakers because or organizations now don't just go to the internet and look for speakers and they don't just open a pile of resumes and, and, and view videos they do those things but the first place they go is social media because they want to know what your people are saying about you. And that brings us to the third element of working our way through the repu meter, and that is you need to develop an ever-increasing circle of influence. Now, I describe a, a, or define a circle of influence this way. I say that a circle of influence is the population within which you can catalyze action relating to your business. So let me repeat that. Your circle of influence is the population within which you can catalyze action pertaining to your business. Now that means there are people that, that you know or people who know you and based on your input, based on your expertise, your ideas, your design, your training, your concepts, your blog posts, whatever it is that you're putting out there in the world, based on what you provide the world, those people change something about their lives. And you need to be getting more and more people applying your stuff so that they're taking action as it pertains to your business. And once you have those three elements in place, now you've got uh, you know a good solid movement in your repu meter towards breakthrough. So the next question then becomes, how do you increase that circle of influence? Well, in order to increase that circle of influence, it works this way, and, and we're just going to touch on this because this isn't really the topic. We could go down a whole rabbit hole on this, but I want you to understand this from the perspective of an, of an aspiring speaker because without this, you're going to really have a really hard time breaking into the speaking world. So here's the thing. This is you and your circle of influence and it represents all the people in your life that know you and that you can catalyze action because of whatever offerings you offer to this world. So here's how most people increase their circle of influence. They go to a BNI meeting or they go to a Chamber of Commerce meeting or they'll go to a social club meeting or they'll, they'll go to some sort of a meetup event and they'll add to their circle of influence one by one. Now that's okay. You've got to do those things. That's called networking and anybody in business will tell you how important networking is. But if you're going to try and increase your circle of influence one by one that way alone, it's going to be a really long road and you're not going to really find a way to move yourself up to that distinctive level. So what we do is we look for people that are way outside our circle of influence and we call them influencers. Now an influencer is going to work this way. Once you can attract an influencer and you can that that influencer knows that you are getting outstanding client results and that some of your circle of influence overlaps their circle of influence and if those people are raving fans then what happens is you draw the attention of the influencers and their circle of influence becomes your circle of influence. So I mentioned a, a few moments ago about my friend Peggy McCall. Now I've known about Peggy for years. She's in, in uh, I'm in her circle of influence, so I knew her long before she knew me. And so when I decided that I needed to expand my business, I she was one of the people I chose as an influencer, and then I was able to bring her into my circle of influence along with a huge part of her circle of influence. So then the next question is, how do we identify influencers? So here are the the, the uh, criteria that we use to identify influencers influencers particularly in the speaking business okay an influencer is somebody who first of all is at the distinctive level or above in their own reputation 
within their circle of influence. So we don't want somebody, it's not that we don't want somebody who's at the obscure or the competitive advantage, competitive level, but as an influencer, they have to be at the distinctive level or above because we want them to be known for the results that they provide. And here's why. Because if they start influencing for us, we become attached to the results that they are known for. Now, when that happens, Peggy, for example, will go out and talk to people in her circle of influence, recommend me as a speaker, and they will call me, and I will go and present. I'm on this call with you today because somebody at ICF said something about me, and ICF reached out to me and brought me here because my reputation within my circle of influence is above the distinctive level. So that's only one measure of the influencer. The second measure of the influencer is this. They also need to have a large, targeted, and complementary circle of influence. And it's in that circle of influence where your speaking engagements are going to come from. So let me just drill down on that just a little bit. So that the we want the influencer to have a large circle of influence, a lot of people, so that makes sense. The circle of influence for that, that person also needs to be targeted. Now what that means is the, uh, the circle of influence for your influencer wants to be an audience that you work with. So, for example, Peggy McCall's audience are all authors. I do a lot of work with authors. Authors have write, written books and they want to speak. So her circle of influence is huge. It's millions of people. And it's targeted because I do work with her audience. And then the third component, it has to be complementary, which means I don't want to be competing with anything that Peggy is doing. And so Peggy teaches people how to write best-selling uh, books, and now she's actually shifted her focus. Now she's known as the millionaire author maker because she's she helps people become millionaire authors. And so now she's known for that. So those are the results that she gets. And so the work that I do is I help them bring their books to the live stage. So it's complementary to her, and it's not um, competitive to her. So. Those two, so far, two uh, qualifications to be an influencer. One, reputation of distinctive or above. Two, large targeted and complementary circle of influence. And number three is they need to be willing to advocate. Now, I couldn't find a good graphic for that, so I just use Fonzie with a thumbs up, you know. So the, your influencers need to be able to talk about you. They need to be willing to say good things about you. And so if any of these elements are missing, then you don't have an influencer. So when you're breaking into the speaking business, what you want to do, one of the first things you want to do is you want to start identifying who are the influencers in your target market, who are the influencers in your business, your area of expertise, and start you know, and start working on them to bring them into your circle of influence. Turn your clients into raving fans. Have your raving fans reach out to those influencers and facilitate introductions and increase that circle of influence of yours. And now you're going to find that your needle on your repu meter is moving up. Your circle of influence is expanding as you become, uh, you know, more known. You get more raving fans. And you've got influencers out there who are going to recommend you for speaking gigs if you let them know that that's what you do. Now, most people who break into the speaking business or try to break into the speaking business don't go very far because they put their life out there, they put themselves out there as a speaker without attracting the proper influencers. So you need to attract the influencers and that's going to make it so much easier for you to get into the speaking business. So your objective as a coach and as an aspiring speaker is to get that repu meter moving and get that needle up at least to the distinctive measure where you are becoming known more more for your results rather than the process that you provide and people start talking about the results that you get because the bottom line on this is the distinctive level on the repu meter equals more speaking gigs. So that is the most important piece I think that I can share with you. I've got another slide coming up later but I'll just go back to this slide for now because I want to talk about um, something different. I want to talk about how do you uh, make money speaking when you're just starting out because there's a there's a, a fallacy out there that says you know what if I if I make a great website and I've got a great video and 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 I and I have great products and, and I put a big price tag on me people are going to hire me to speak now that happens sometimes but you don't want to base your entire speaking business career on something that happens sometimes you want to build it by design so how do you actually start making money speaking? Well, here's the first thing. If first thing is you need to get experience speaking. You need to be a good speaker. And if you're not, you're really going to struggle. So if you're at the level where you're saying, you know, someday I'd like to be a public speaker, then 
you're not ready to start asking money for your presentations yet. What you need to do if you're at that level is get yourself to Toastmasters. Uh, if there's one nearby, get yourself to a Dale Carnegie course or a Christopher Leadership course if there's one nearby or some sort of a public speaking course so that you can develop some basic skills on the stage. Then you need to get yourself on some free, safe stages. So you want to look for places like Service Clubs, Lions Club, Rotary Club, Kiwanis Club, Optimus Clubs. All the service clubs are out there are always looking for speakers. Um, check out BNI chapters, Chambers of Commerce, meetup groups, local association meetings. Any place you can find that will put you on a stage. Because by the time you hit the stage where you're going to be asking for money, you need to be a professional level speaker. Now. Until you get to that point, there are still ways to make money. The two best ways to make money as an aspiring speaker are these. Number one, selling from the stage. And number two, creating your own live events. So let me talk about those. Now I know that we, you know, the topic of this was, you know, how to get paid speaking gigs. You get paid speaking gigs by elevating your repu meter as a speaker, and you do that the same way you do it as in any other business, and that is by getting outstanding client results, turning those results into raving fans, and then elevating and increasing your circle of influence. So one way to do that is to start, you know, speaking for free at local organizations. But learn how to sell your products and services from the stage. And now, especially coaches uh, have a great advantage in this area because a lot of us have, uh, uh, as coaches, we have some fairly expensive programs to sell. And so, I have several clients. In fact, I have many clients that I've, you know, trained to speak over the years who would never agree to accepting a speaking fee because they can make far more money upselling to their coaching and mentorship programs. So selling from the stage is a really great way to earn money before you actually become known as a professional speaker where people will pay you a speaking fee. So you can sell your training programs, you can sell your books, you can sell audios, you can sell videos, you can sell all kinds of stuff and you can make fortunes. I have, I have clients who make in the six figures when they go in and speak for free. And so that is becoming a very dominant uh, way to make money from the stage. Now. There isn't a whole science behind that because what happens is there's been so many people doing it uh, and audiences are really getting sort of fatigued with the high pressure sales pitch approach. And so we don't want to have that high pressure sales pitch approach. There are ways to sell from the stage by delivering you know, immense content, really good high value content. I don't mean uh, a lot of content, I mean high value content. And you don't want to confuse volume for value which means a lot of content does not necessarily provide good value. You need to really understand the delivery of value as opposed to volume. So you can deliver amazing value content and, and uh, have a very soft sales approach and do very, very, very well. It's a skill that you need to explore. It's a skill you should develop and you can really start making money very quickly if you learn that skill to sell from the stage. And then the, the second one I mentioned was to create your own live events. I did that for years. I still do that. Most of my revenue as a speaker comes from my own events that I hold all over the world. And you can can start as simple as, as something uh, with meetup.com and you just go and set up an event and you'll, you know, when I first ran an event here uh, in, in my hometown in Ottawa, Canada, I used to run this event called Your Stage and what it was was a little speaking event where, uh, you know, some people could come and I would invite some people on the stage to speak and I would do a little bit of coaching and, and that's how I thought I would sort of get started and so um, I used to run these events uh, and the first time I ran the event, I think I had maybe 18 people show up and then I had 26 and then I had 37 and then I had 50 and then I had 60 and then I was getting 100, 120, 150 people at these events and I wasn't making any money on these events. I mean, people would pay to come only to cover the cost of the venue. So I wasn't making any money on the events. But where I was making money was is where people would buy my stuff. So they would buy my book or they would hire me to train them or they would come and attend one of my weekend workshops, one of those things, right? So creating my own live events has been and still is a huge way that I generate revenue. And then the third way to make money from the stage, of course, is the paid speaking fee. Now, here's where there's a bit of a misconception in the world of speaking is, you know, that most speakers are paid a speaking fee. And that used to be the case. That used to be the case, but it's not anymore. A lot of speakers, and I would say the majority of speakers, are making their money by either consulting 
or by training or by coaching or by mentorship or by product sales and a lot of them are still getting speakers fees uh, but I know so many of them who just you know they would never take a fee uh, because they just make so much more money uh, selling their products and services and creating their own events so just to recap really quickly how you start making money from the stage number one is you've got to get good on the stage that is the first thing if you hit the stage before you're ready to deliver good value uh, you're not going to be on the stage very long. So you got to learn how to get those those uh, platform skills up, and you've got to be able to deliver value as opposed to volume. Then you want to learn how to sell from the stage. You want to get on those free stages, even the, the, the Lions Club and the Kiwanis Club and the Rotary Clubs and the BNIs and the Chambers of Commerce and all of those. You can speak for free there, and you can make an offer, and, they, and, and you can generate revenue from those. So learn how to sell from the stage. And then the next thing was to learn how to create your own live events and get people to come to your events and then you can upsell them. Now all of that is so valuable because in addition to generating revenue for you, you're also moving that repu meter up that ladder up towards the distinctive level. And when you hit the distinctive level, that's when people are going to start paying you to speak. Because the people who are going to start paying you fees, your, your speaker's fee, these people are going to be checking you out on social media. They're going to be talking to your clients. They're going to be talking to their organizations with whom you've spoken. They're going to be scoping you out that way and looking for the results that you provide because they already know you can speak. What they need to know is, can you provide the results? So while you're doing all these things, you're speaking at the, the freebies, the Chamber of Commerce and those things, and you're learning how to sell from the stage, and you're creating your own live events, you're moving that ladder, that needle up the ladder towards the position where people will be more likely to approach you to speak. Okay? So when you're speaking, whether it's a free event uh, or uh, whether it's an event that somebody is paying you a small fee, this is another thing that happens oftentimes is speakers will be paid a small fee, $100, $200, $300, like a little honorarium fee, and the organization will allow you to make an offer, so there's, a, there's combined ways to do it. But every speaker at some point wants to get to the position where they speak full time. And all they want to do is speak and get paid and speak and get paid and speak and get paid. And that is a beautiful world to be in. And you can get there. And the way you get there is by paying your dues through everything that we talked about today. Because I have clients all over the world who are full-time speakers. Now, when I say full-time, I don't mean they work 40 hours a week. They may speak twice a week. They may speak once a week, three times a month, five times a month, sometimes four times a month. And, and, but this is their full-time income. This is all they do. And you can get to that point, but you first have to have that repu meter up the ladder so that people recognize you as somebody distinctive they, and you are a category of one and they want you. So there are lots of opportunities for you to speak for free and generate business. Um, the other thing that you want to be aware of is you can also speak for free and generate business indirectly by using lead capture strategies. And I do this all the time. I will speak for free at certain organizations under certain conditions, and I'll tell you what those conditions are in a moment. And I don't do it as much as I used to, but uh, I will speak for free under certain conditions as long as I can either A, make an offer, or B, build my list and have a lead capture strategy to capture the email addresses and names of everybody in the audience so that I can then market to them through online marketing. Now, here's where I will absolutely not speak for free and neither should you. You should not speak for free under these conditions. If this combination of conditions exist, then I don't recommend you speak for free. Number one, if the event is a for-profit event, so that means that the organizers of the event are making money off the event. The audience is not part of your target market. That that means is there will be no influencers in the audience. So, for example, I spoke recently at, a, at an event for the Ontario government. They paid me my speaking fee, but the audience were pilots, and they wanted some, uh, you know, they wanted some instruction on presentation skills and so forth. So I did it. But that audience is not my target market. So had they called me and said, "Listen, we want us, want you to speak for free uh, at this event, and it's all pilots," uh, I would not do that because the audience is not part of my target audience, and there will likely be no influencers for me within that audience. 
And then the third thing is if you are not permitted to make an offer or capture leads, then, then I don't speak for free. So I speak for free if these conditions exist. If it's a nonprofit organization uh, and or if the audience is large and is targeted, which means that it's, it is my target market and I believe that there may be some potential influencers in the audience, then I, will, I may speak for free. And if I can make an offer and or capture leads. If those conditions exist, then I will consider speaking for free because oftentimes I can generate far more business and revenue and impact on my reputation doing those gigs rather than turning them down. But I won't speak for free when somebody calls and says, you know, we're having a business meeting and we've got a team of pilots here and we want you to speak for free, but you can't promote anything and you can't sell anything. Then why would I do that? You're going to get a lot of people tell you this. You're going to get a lot of people say, well, it's good exposure. You can speak for exposure. Let me tell you, and I guarantee you this, speaking for exposure is not a transfer of value. You are not exchanging value by speaking for exposure. It doesn't work. It has never worked, and it's never going to work. Because if you're speaking for exposure in front of an audience that has no interest really in what you do and very little likelihood of hiring you for anything and has no influencers in it, then you're not going to be able to generate any results, any return on your investment. So watch out for those words, speak for exposure. Now. I'm here at this event speaking, uh, you know, virtually, and uh, as you know, I'm not being paid for this. This is a free thing, but I agreed to do this because this is a good forum for me, right? This is a good organization with a large targeted audience right down my alley, and now they've asked me on this call, you know, not to make an offer, which I'm not, and not, you know, not to do those things, and I'm not going to do those things. It's still worth it for me to be here because being here helps me elevate my needle up the ladder. Right, And so this is a good thing for me to do. So one of the things you want to do as an aspiring speaker is really be able to tell where should you speak for free and where should you not speak for free. So let's talk about now how you set fees as a speaker. How do you go about determining what you're worth when you're going to market yourself out there uh, as a speaker. And, and understand something. I said earlier that the biggest mistake that I see speakers make, aspiring speakers, is that they market themselves as a speaker prematurely. What I mean by that is they take themselves and they put themselves out there primarily as a speaker and not primarily as an expert. So in your marketing, you should position yourself primarily as an expert in your field who also happens to speak professionally. So put this speaking thing out there. Just don't lead with it. You don't want to pigeon yourself, uh, pigeonhole yourself as yet another aspiring speaker because it's a pit that is really difficult to get out of. What you want to do is position yourself as the known expert in your field who also happens to speak. So when you get to that point and it's time to start talking about speaking fees, how do you set a speaking fee? Well, here's the thing. There's actually no magic formula for it. Uh, there's no magic formula. There's no magic system. There's no science behind it. Uh, you pick a fee and charge it. But there are some strategies that you can use. So um, the first thing that we need to understand is that when we're setting fees as a speaker, those fees are going to be based on the perceived value of your expertise and reputation. That's why the repu-meter piece is so important. That's why it's so critically important to get that needle up to the distinctive stage and beyond. Because at the distinctive stage, the perceived value of your expertise and your reputation absolutely skyrockets. Because when you become known as not just another speaker, but one of these speakers who or better yet, the speaker who, now your perceived value absolutely skyrockets and you can charge you know, substantial fees. So we're going to sort of get, um, we're not going to reach up into the uh, celebrity area in this discussion. You know, the celebrity uh, you know, speakers who get the twenty-five and fifty and hundred thousand dollars speaking fees, uh, those they, they can happen. They do exist. Generally they are celebrity speakers of some status and and I'm not one of those speakers and so I'm not going to speak about that world. But what I am going to speak about is the world where most speakers get paid a healthy speaking fee because that's where we want to get to. And then if if you are one of the celebrities or if you happen to reach celebrity status, well, that I mean, that's great. I mean, great. Good for you. <laughs> That'd be terrific. But most of us are not there. So how do we elevate 
uh, how do we sort of establish our fees based on the perceived value of our expertise and reputation? So there are basically um, three ways that you can set your fees. One way is what I call event-based. And a lot of speakers, and in fact most speakers, aspiring speakers, um, set their fees based on the event. And what I mean by that is this. There will be a fee for a keynote address. There will be a different fee for a breakout session. There will be a different fee for a workshop. Now, that's a legitimate way to do it, and, and there's no problem doing that. Um, I don't do that anymore. And the reason I don't do that, we're going to talk numbers as well in a few minutes, so hang in there with me. But the reason I don't use event-based fees anymore is because I'm finding that the organizations, associations, and corporations, and meeting planners are finding it a little bit complicated now, uh, and they don't really want to have to spend the time to figure these things out. Is this a keynote, or is this a breakout? Or if it's a breakout, is it a workshop? And if it's, if it's a workshop, it's going to cost this. So what I do is I do what's called a day rate. I have a day rate for my speaking, one fee, and for that fee, you can have me for 15 minutes or you can have me for eight hours, anywhere in between. I will speak once, I will speak 12 times, I will do whatever you need done in that time, um, but, it, you won't, but that's the fee. And most often, uh, when I do a keynote address, I'm doing a 45-minute or maybe a 60-minute keynote address, and I charge my day fee. And they, they keep saying to me, well, what if we only want you for a 30-minute keynote? It's, it's the fee. Uh, what if we want you for six hours? That's the fee. It's the fee. The fee is the fee. And a lot of uh, speakers now are moving to the day rate position because it just makes it so much easier for the organizer. Now, here's where you can run into some dissonance on your own part. And, and we, if, if you're going to charge a day rate, you have to get over this piece. You have to be willing to lose the business. You've got to be willing to lose the gig. So if I say, you know, my day rate is X, and they say, well, we don't want you for a whole day. We only need you for 40 minutes. I have to be willing, because of what's called fee integrity, I need to be able to say to them, it's still my day rate. That's my rate, period. And if they try and negotiate down, um, then I have to be prepared to lose the gig. So let's talk about that for one, one minute, because um, you're going to get them. They're always going to want to try and negotiate you down. So let's talk about that for a minute. I never reduce my speaking fee, ever. But what I will do is negotiate value in exchange for value, which means I will accept a lower fee in exchange for something else. And it could be a number of things. It could be maybe they'll buy a copy of my book for everybody in the audience, in which case, okay, I'll speak for a little bit less. Maybe they'll guarantee a second speaking engagement. Okay, I'll speak for a little less in exchange for that. Maybe it's being professionally videotaped and I'd like a copy of the video. Maybe I'll ask them for a video testimonial. Maybe I want an introduction to a certain influencer. So there's all kinds of different ways where I can maintain my fee integrity without actually lowering my fee. Now, I lower the fee, but always in exchange for something. I never discount my fee in exchange for nothing. And so that's a really important thing because what happens is as soon as you become known as the speaker who discounts your fee, then everybody's going to want to discount your fee. Because remember the repu meter thing that we talked about earlier? That works for you. It can also work against you because your reputation can become something that you don't want. And you don't want to be known as the speaker who will reduce their fee just for the asking. So you establish your fee, whatever it is, and you keep it there. So, so far we've talked about two fee structures. We've talked about event-based fees and we've talked about day rate fees. The third fee structure is much more complicated, uh, and I don't use this one because I haven't actually figured it out very well yet, but it's called value-based fees. The va value-based uh, value fees are really a consultative approach where you explore the client's needs, you explore the client's expected outcomes, and base your fee on the expected return to the client. And I know some speakers who do this exceptionally well, not very many of them, but when you do this, what will happen is you're going to end up charging every client a different amount of money depending on what their desired and expected return is on your participation. So it's a very complicated thing, but it's a very easy, uh, it's an easy way to elevate your fees, but it's a complicated thing to implement. Okay, so, um, so we talked about event-based fees, uh, which is where most people go, and, and you're welcome to do that, which are 
one fee for a keynote, a different fee for a breakout, a different fee for a workshop. You've got the day rate, which is one fee for the entire day, no matter how long. You've got the value-based fees, which are um, you know based on the outcome. And then the other last piece about the fees is about expenses. Should you include expenses or not? What most people are doing, most speakers are using the event-based fees plus expenses. And that's okay. That's a legitimate approach. But what I've been finding over the last several years is that organizations seem to really appreciate the all-in approach. So my first, my default position is, here's my day rate. It includes taxes. It includes all my accommodations and all my own travel. So at, at first blush, my day rate seems very high. And then when I say that includes my travel, includes my accommodation, and includes taxes, okay, then it doesn't seem quite as high. And so I like that approach because it leaves me free to, uh, uh, to book my own accommodations, my own travel. I like having control over these things because I like deciding where I'm going to stay, when I'm going to travel. So, for example, I, I hardly ever, if ever, travel on a speaking day. I won't travel in and I won't travel out, uh, if at all possible. Because I don't want to be rushing for the for the plane, you know, rushing for the train, rushing for the cab. I don't want to have to deal with any of that kind of stuff. So I always a speaking gig out of town for me is always at least two nights in a hotel. Well, I don't want to stay in a hotel where somebody else is deciding that they're trying to save money. I stay in a nice hotel, so I book it. So I, I put all of that into my fee and offer a one fee uh, for the day, and, and it's all inclusive. That's just the way I do it, and people seem to appreciate it. It seems to work. So we've covered a lot of things today here. We've covered the, the repu meter. We've covered the, the biggest mistake that speakers uh, make when they're starting out. We, just, we talked about speaking fees. Uh, we talked about when to speak for free, how to generate revenue from by selling, how to generate revenue from the stage by building your list. There's a lot in there in a very compressed amount of time. And so uh, I'm going to open it up for, uh, for questions uh, in just a moment. Before I do, I just want to give you these two websites that you can access. The first one, freepublicspeakingvideos.com. This is where I give away eight free videos uh, that will help you with your speaking skills. Uh, and they're, they're free. You can just go and grab them. They'll come in your email. You get instant access. And it, a lot of really great presentation skills in there. And the other thing I wanted to offer to you, because you're part of ICF, is um, if you want to chat with me, if you've got questions about your presentation, about your business, and you want to really start you know, asking questions specifically that apply to you, then uh, if you go to meetstevelowell.com, you're going to see there that I give away a 15-minute uh, consultation to everybody. But uh, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you want to chat with me, uh, and we can do this anywhere in the world because we can do it over Skype, uh, but if you want to chat with me, go to meetstevelowell.com, and in the comments where you set the appointment, uh, just put ICF in there, uh, and you and I will chat for 30, 35, 40 minutes, whatever it takes to answer your questions. I'll be very, very generous with you just because you're part of ICF. So that's the presentation. I hope you got some value out of that, and I think we have a few minutes left for some questions. So uh, I'm not seeing the uh, I'm not seeing the, uh, the the login screen here or the the questions or anything. So I'm going to leave it up to our moderators to fire out the questions, and we'll address them one at a time. Who has the first question? Great, thank you, Steve. That was that was absolutely brilliant, and so much content packed into a, a short period of time. We do have many questions that have come in. Uh, let's start with this one. Um, what is the most effective way to sell from the stage, and in particular, if you're selling, if what you want to sell is your coaching services, how how do you get that message across? Okay, so thank you. So the question about getting your message across in, in selling from the stage is a big, big question. Um, and so I'll give you a very short version of it. First thing is you really need to deliver tremendous value in your presentation that demonstrates your value as a coach. What you don't want to do is get caught into the rabbit hole of teaching stuff. And, and teaching facts and figures and all those things. You want to deliver value that people can actually use when they leave so that when they leave your presentation, they feel like they, they can actually make a difference in their lives based on what you've done, but they still need more. And so through your presentation, you also want to do what's called seeding, which 
you know, you maybe uh, present something in your presentation, and then you're going to say something like, you know, in my in my VIP coaching program, we cover all nine of these steps. We only have time for three today, but if you want to talk about those other nine, come and see me after. So you don't want to do a hard sell. You just want to plant it along the way. So those are just two of, of two answers to a very big question. And so just to repeat very quickly, number one is really good value. I mean, deliver excellent value. And number two, seed it lightly along the way just so that people know that there's coaching available. Great. Um, you know, several questions came in um, wanting to know about speaking rates. What, what can you share on that? Okay, so let's talk about that real quick. Um, there, there's no rules for these, but here are some general guidelines that appear to hold true. Okay? Aspiring speakers uh, are going to charge somewhere up to about $3,000 per event. Okay? Now, organizations who have a small budget, who are not spending big bucks on the event, uh, and who have, you know, they're not looking for the big star speaker, uh, they are going to hire people for, you know, up to $3,000. From three to five thousand dollars is you're at a bit, a bit of a different level now. Uh, from three to five thousand dollars, the clients are going to expect a little bit more from you in terms of your skill and your professionalism. You're probably going to need to be an author, have a book published, or some sort of a program available uh, that can add to your credibility. And from into three to five thousand dollars, you are going to want to be known as somebody who has accomplished something significant within your industry. Then there's a, a range from five to ten thousand. Five to ten thousand dollars. Now um, you're going to be dealing with uh, larger organizations, uh, larger corporations, maybe government departments. These are people who um, are going to be definitely hiring you for a specific, um, specific wisdom, specific talent, specific skill or expertise that you have demonstrated. And they, they don't want any speaker. They, they, they pretty much want you or somebody just like you. And so the five to ten thousand is a healthy range, but you're going to need to be able to really demonstrate uh, strong professionalism and ability in speaking, and some sort of accolades in terms of something being published or something along those lines. From the up above the ten thousand dollar range, everything changes. At the ten thousand dollar range, now what happens is from ten thousand and above. You're going to be dealing with larger events, uh, event planners. You might be dealing possibly with speakers bureaus, although that's a whole different discussion. Um, you're going to be dealing with organizations who spend, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or more on their event uh, and are looking for some really amazing speakers to be on that stage. Now, if we backtrack a little bit and go from one, you know, up to three thousand. Typically, those speakers are going to be breakout speakers. You're not generally going to get on the on the main stage as a as a, a you know a two or three thousand dollar speaker. From three to five thousand, you may get on some of the, on the main stage in a small spot, but again, you're likely going to be in the breakout uh, area. So at the three to five thousand, you might do a, a a short keynote and a breakout. From five up to ten, in there, uh, you you are more likely going to be a main stage speaker, and they may ask you to do some a breakout and some training, maybe. And then after ten thousand and above, um, you're a main pretty pretty much a main stage speaker, and they're not likely going to uh, request that you do a breakout because above that stage, you're pretty much known as a main stage keynote speaker. And this is where you can really generate massive revenues in consulting fees and so forth. So what you want to do is figure out where are you on that repu meter in, in your circle of influence. If you're in the obscure, working your way up towards the competitive, then you're probably the 3,000 or under. If you're reaching competitive and just starting to get above competitive and people are starting to talk about you a little more, you might be in the three to five thousand dollar range. If you're approaching distinctive or you're just about at the distinctive, maybe just past distinctive, you're maybe up into the seven, seven and a half, ten thousand dollar range if you're you know over the distinctive line. And if you're plummeting over down right over towards breakthrough and you're you know really causing waves in the world, uh, then you can get up you know over ten thousand. Uh, and 12 and 15 and in that area. And then the uh, it'll be the celebrity speakers that are going to get the 17, 20, 25, 50, 50, you know, up, way up there. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I, that was great. That was really thorough. And I, I think it gives people a, a, a feel for where they might be. Um, a, a question about um, showcase, showcasing raving fans. What What's the best place to do that? Is that testimonials on your website? How do you get other people to know that the world is... is uh, 
super excited about who you are and what makes you great. Okay, um, I didn't catch all of that. You cut out, but I think the question was about uh, turning people into raving fans. How do you get the world to know about you? So yeah, uh, the, uh, well, actually, the you know what, Steve? Came out, so can I can I just um, uh, just just for a little clarification? It, it's more about you have those raving fans. How do you get other people to know about them? Is it testimonials? How do you make it visible that you have these rave, raving fans? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, you cut out again. Are you asking about how to get testimonials? No, no, no. Um, uh, what I'm saying is uh, raving fans, uh, when you have them, what's the best way to showcase your raving fans? Testimonials uh, or... Okay, gotcha. Okay, gotcha. Okay, what's the best way to showcase them? Okay, again, a uh, huge question, but here's a short answer. Um, number one, uh, and these are not necessarily in order of priority, but number one is use social media. So I would get those testimonials on video, and I would get people to share them. I wouldn't share them yourself. You get your fans to share them. Get them to thank you on social media. In fact, if you go on my Facebook page uh, today, if you go on my Facebook, my personal Facebook page, um, you're going to see a great testimonial that was posted just today by one of my clients in New Zealand. That helps me, uh, you know, get the word out. Other ways to get the word out are within the context of your content. When you're teaching your stuff, when you're speaking, pop testimonials in there that are relevant to your content. So, for example. I didn't do it here today, but if I was selling something at the end of this uh, program, what I would do is when I'm talking about speaking fees, I would show a short testimonial of one of my clients that you know said, I worked with Steve and I doubled my speaking fee. If I was talking about how to sell from the stage, I would show a short testimonial about a client who did six figures from the stage. So I would plaster my, you know, position my testimonials within my content very selectively and very strategically so that they don't sound like a bragging, but they sound like um, you know supporting a, a, a point that I've made. So number one is get those testimonials, get your people to share your stuff, get them out there on social media, and number two is get the testimonials inside your content. Now also, you know, you want to put testimonials on your website and, and that kind of thing as well, obviously, that's, that's pretty obvious, but there's, a, there's a multiple ways that you can leverage testimonials and leverage people talking about you. If you're speaking at an event and you have a client in the audience, get them on the stage. I do that all the time. Get them on the stage and have them talk about what's changed in their lives. So it's really about encouraging people to talk about you more than you talking about yourself. So if I understood the question, I'm hoping that answered it. That was it, Steve. Thank you. Um, uh, another question on, on um, attracting influencers. How do you do that? How do you start to attract influencers where you don't really have a track record in speaking yet? Right. Okay. So again, uh, if I understood the question, and the connection is not good at my end, but if I understood the question, it has to do with how do you attract influencers if you're not speaking yet? Is that what I got? That's exactly right. Okay, cool. I think that's it. So here's how you do it. I mean, again, um, you know, big question, but here's a way to start. The best way to attract an influencer is to start advocating for them. Become a fan of theirs. Start advocating for them. Start sharing their work. Start talking about them. And then if, if it's somebody that you don't know, ask for an introduction or go to one of their events. I'll tell you how I met Peggy McCall. She was having a book launch uh, close to where I live. She didn't know me, but I knew I needed to meet her. And so I ended up going to her book launch, and I walked right up to her, and I introduced myself, and I basically said, you don't know me yet, but you will. Uh, and, then, and then I just kept following her. I'd you know, share her content, not stalking her, obviously, but professionally sharing her content, reaching out to her, and then I'd find out who our common influence or who our common circles of influence are. Who knows me that knows her? And I would ask them, hey, listen, would you do me a favor and just, you know, next time you're talking to Peggy, just if you don't mind, just, you know, mention my name. You know, and I get that kind of thing happening, and that draws the attention of influencers. And I've drawn the attention of some very major world-class influencers by doing those things. But it, it all really is based on the principle number one that we talked about at the very beginning, and that is you need to get outstanding client results. Nothing is going to happen until you start demonstrating that you can develop and, and generate outstanding client results. 
And if that's not happening for you and your clients, you, you got to start there. You got to get better at what you do, learn more, just get those results and get people talking about them. Fantastic. Well, Steve, uh, we're going to have to leave it there, but a, a giant thanks to you uh, from me and from, of course, the ICF and everyone on the line for sharing uh, really great insights, and, and uh, I'm sure everyone's leaving with something that's going to be valuable for them so that they can start to make some revenue from public speaking. Uh, so uh, many thanks, Steve.